Hello again, welcome to Cardinal Science. This is part two of ionic bonding. Right, so moving on from part one of this video, we start with point 1.40, learning how to draw dot and cross diagrams to show the formation of ionic compounds. Okay, uh, then we move on to 1.41, understand ionic bonding in terms of electrostatic attractions. 4.2, understanding why compounds with giant ionic lattices have high melting and boiling points. And 4.3, we need to know that ionic compounds do not conduct electricity when solid, but do when molten and in aqueous solutions. What is an ionic bond? Now, ionic bonds form because atoms try to achieve full outer shells. This confers upon them extra stability. Now, in the case of metals bonding with non-metals, this is achieved by the transfer of one or more electrons from a metal to a non-metal. This transfer of electrons inevitably leads to the formation of ions. Now, since oppositely charged ions attract, they therefore form an ionic bond. So for example, if I was to show you sodium chloride, so you've got your sodium atom, okay, and your chlorine atom. The sodium atom has one electron in the outer shell, and it will transfer that one electron to the chlorine. Now, the loss of an electron in the sodium causes it to form a sodium one plus ion and the gain of an electron in the chlorine causes it to form a Cl1 minus ion, a chloride ion. Now you can see these are oppositely attracted and therefore they will form an ionic bond and that will make NaCl. Now let's represent this in a dot and cross diagram. So we'll do sodium chloride again. So first we start off with a sodium atom, two, eight, one. And I'm gonna draw all of the sodium electrons in blue, and I'm going to do those as dots. So we've got two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second shell, and one in the third shell. So two, eight, one. And that is sodium. Then we have the chlorine atom, which is two, eight, seven. I'll do those as crosses. Okay, now, since we know that sodium needs to lose one electron to get full outer shell, and chlorine needs to gain one electron to get full outer shell, what happens is we get the removal of this electron from the sodium to the chlorine. Okay, it's been transferred. Now what we need to do is we redraw them as ions, like I showed in the previous video, to represent the bonding. So the sodium has become sodium one plus ion and its new electron configuration is going to be two eight because of course that outer shell is now empty okay and let's not forget the positive charge and then the chloride ion is now two eight eight because of course it now has that one electron from the sodium atom in its outer shell. And I'll represent those with a dot so we can see that that's the electron that came from the sodium. So now we've represented sodium chloride as an ionic bond. Let's do another example. We'll do magnesium oxide. So magnesium is 282. Now we'll only show the outer shell electrons here. Okay, but we just have to remember that they are there. And it has two electrons in the outer shell. It's in group two. Okay, and of course, the other element in this case is oxygen. And that's going to be two, six, it has six in the outer shell, because of course, it's in group six. Now the magnesium needs to lose two, and the oxygen needs to gain two. Therefore, we get a transfer of electrons from the magnesium to the oxygen. Magnesium in this case will form a two plus ion because it's lost two electrons and the oxygen will form a two minus ion because it's gained two electrons. So now of course the magnesium has collapsed back to its second shell. So it's now two eight, and it's an Mg two plus ion. And of course we have our eight electrons in this outer shell that we now have to draw because of course we only represent the outer shell electrons here. And then of course in our oxygen, we have 
eight electrons also, but not forgetting that we need to include the two dots for the ones that came from the magnesium. And the electron configuration of oxygen now is two eight also. That's an oxygen two minus ion. Now, thankfully the specification actually specifies specific combinations of elements of which you need to be able to do this for. So I'll go through every single possible combination. And once you've done and practiced all of these, there's no question in the exam that you wouldn't be able to do because it will be one of these combinations. So you have group one elements with group five, six or seven, group two with five, six or seven, or group three with five, six or seven. Right, so we'll start with group one and the combinations with group five, six or seven elements. So things to remember is that group one elements will form one plus ions because they lose one electron. Group five elements will gain three electrons to get filled outer shell and form three minus ions. Group six elements have six in the outer shell and will gain two to become two minus ions. And group seven have seven in the outer shell and they will form one minus ions because they gain one electron. Now, I've selected sodium from group one right now, but it doesn't matter which one you're using. Okay, it will be the same. And I've selected nitrogen, oxygen, and chlorine to represent the elements in groups five, six, or seven. But again, it doesn't matter which one you're using. So we'll start with the top, sodium bonding with nitrogen. Now, you'll notice that nitrogen has five in the outer shell, it needs to gain three electrons. That means we're going to need three sodiums to bond with it. So we can already put a three down here. Now, what we're going to be making is Na3N, okay? And I'll show you how this works. So three sodium atoms, each of which is going to give up one electron to this nitrogen. And so we end up with three times this here, all right? So three times sodium with eight electrons in its second shell. And that, of course, is a one plus ion. So we've got three one plus ions. Now the nitrogen gaining three electrons becomes a three minus ion. So you can see we've balanced the charges there, three pluses and three minuses. And it of course has the five electrons that it already had. And it has three extra electrons, one from each of those sodium atoms. And so we've therefore formed sodium nitride. Now for the next one, sodium with oxygen. We're going to need two sodiums because of course the oxygen needs to gain two. Therefore, we're going to have a two here and we're going to be forming Na2O, sodium oxide. The sodium will look exactly the same as it did in the last question. Okay, eight electrons in the outer shell, having collapsed down from losing its outer shell electron, it will be a one plus ion. And the oxygen with its six electrons in the outer shell will have gained two electrons, one from each of the sodiums. And that will of course form a two minus ion. And you can see we've balanced the charges. There are two positives and two negatives. Finally, sodium with chlorine, just like we did in the previous questions. Chlorine will need to gain one electron, so we only need one sodium to do it. The sodium will look identical as it did before. It will form a one plus ion with eight electrons in its outer shell. And the chlorine, having seven in the outer shell already, will gain one electron and get a fill outer shell, and of course form a one minus ion, and that makes NaCl. The next set of combinations is the group two elements bonding with groups five, six, or seven. Now, group two elements form two plus ions, in this case, I'm using magnesium. It has two electrons in the outer shell, and it will give up both of those to form an ionic bond. We'll start off with bonding magnesium to nitrogen. Now, magnesium forms a two plus ion, and nitrogen will form a three minus ion. Now, it's a little bit tricky with regard to forming our compound. So we use the crossing over method from the previous video, and we'll take the two from the magnesium two plus and put it over here, and the three from the nitrogen three minus over here, and we get Mg3N2. Now that makes sense because we have three two plus ions, which makes six plus, and two three minus ions, which makes six minus. So we're balanced. 
Now each of those magnesiums will lose those two electrons and the shell will collapse and we'll be left with eight electrons in the outer shell. And of course we formed a magnesium two plus ion, three of them. Now the nitrogen, having had five in the outer shell already, will gain three electrons and will form in nitrogen three minus ion, two of those. That's now balanced and we're now finished. Now magnesium bonded with oxygen is a nice easy one. Magnesium needs to lose two, oxygen needs to gain two. It's one to one. So we get the same as before. Magnesium, eight electrons in the outer shell and forms a two plus ion. And then of course, oxygen being the other way around has got six in the outer shell gains two electrons and forms an oxygen two minus ion. So we form MgO. Last one, magnesium bonded with chlorine. Now the chlorine only requires one electron. The magnesium needs to get rid of two. So we're going to need two chloride ions for every magnesium ion. So it's going to have a two and we're going to be making MgCl2. Same as before, magnesium two plus ion eight in the outer shell. Make sure we put our charge in and we're going to have two chlorine one minus ions. And that will look like this with seven electrons in the outer shell, followed by one from each of those magnesium. Finally, we've got group three bonding with groups five, six or seven. Now we have aluminium in this case, there's three in the outer shell, it'll lose three electrons to form a three plus ion. When it bonds with nitrogen, it's nice and easy, it's one to one, because the nitrogen forms a three minus ion. So we'll have our aluminium three plus ion bonding with nitrogen three minus ion. The aluminium, of course, will have eight electrons in its outer shell. It was two, eight, three. It's lost those three, so now it's just two, eight. And the nitrogen, having five to start with has gained three electrons from the aluminium. Okay, the next one, aluminium with oxygen. Aluminium with oxygen forms Al2O3. We can test this by doing our crossing over method. Aluminium three plus O2 minus, so we write AlO, and we take the numbers to either side, three goes there, two goes there, Al2O3. Now, the aluminium will be the same. Eight electrons in the outer shell, three plus ion. There are going to be two of them. Okay, and the oxygen will be a two minus ion. There'll be three of them. And of course, it has six electrons in its outer shell that it started with and two extras. Now you can see that we've got two three pluses and three two minuses, so that balances, and we therefore have Al2O3. Finally, aluminium with chlorine, it's gonna form AlCl3, because of course, the chlorine only needs to gain one, the aluminium has three, and therefore, we need three chlorines to allow the aluminium to have a full outer shell. So once again, the aluminium will look the same. Eight electrons in its outer shell now, It'll be a three plus ion. And of course, we're going to have three chlorine one minus ions. They have seven in the outer shell to start with. And each one of those has gained one electron from the aluminium atom. Now, you might be asked to describe ionic bonds in terms of the electrostatic attractions. Now, what you need to talk about here is of course, that an ionic bond is an attraction an electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. So in sodium chloride, we have sodium one plus ions and chlorine one minus ions, and they attract each other because they are oppositely charged. Okay, just like in any of the other options, when we had magnesium two plus with oxygen two minus attracting each other, or in any of the more complicated ones, for example, with Al2O3, we have aluminium three plus ions attracting O2 minus ions. The key here 
is that an ionic bond is an electrostatic attraction between oppositely charged ions. Unlike in covalent bonding, where you get simple molecular structures forming, ionic compounds actually form something called giant ionic lattices. Now, these lattices are made up of many charged ions, oppositely charged, and of course, they're therefore held together by strong electrostatic attractions. Okay, now it would be the breaking of these strong electrostatic attractions that would need to be done to melt or boil ionic compounds. And therefore, it takes a lot of energy to overcome these attractions. Okay, so in this diagram here, you're seeing a 2D representation of what would be a 3D lattice. And you can see that surrounding every single positive charge are negative charges. And likewise, surrounding any of the negative charges, the chloride ions in this case, we have sodium ions. So it's an alternating structure between the sodium one plus ions and the chloride one minus ions. And these blue lines just represent the strong electrostatic attractions between them. Now, another of the key properties of giant ionic lattices that you need to know about is its electrical conductivity. Now, looking at the rigid structure that I've drawn here and imagine it in 3D, we can see that there aren't any electrons that are free to move and there aren't any ions that are free to move. So when ionic compounds are solid, they do not conduct electricity. However, when they're molten, the ions themselves are actually able to move. The ions become free to move. Okay. And if you recall from previous videos, ions being free to move or electrons being free to move allows the conduction of electricity. Therefore, when ionic compounds are in molten state or dissolved in a solution, they do conduct electricity. And it's because the ions are free to move. So how is this typically examined? Well, bonding is actually a very, very common topic and it normally comes with quite a lot of marks. There's a fair bit of comparison often made between metallic bonding, covalent bonding and ionic bonding. But I'll focus on the questions here that just relate to ionic bonding. So the first one you might be asked, maybe a two mark question, describe the bonding in sodium chloride or another ionic compound in terms of electrostatic attractions. And that's where you would say, in this example, you have sodium one plus ions that have strong electrostatic attractions to the chloride one minus ions. For number two, you might be asked to draw a dot and cross diagram to show the bonding, like I did in those three slides where we talked about the different combinations of elements. Okay, so you'd have to draw the atoms first, often showing the electron configurations, then indicate the movement of the electrons, like I did with arrows, and then redrawing the ions next to each other with their charges and the new electron configurations. For number three, you could be asked to describe the bonding and explain why it has a high melting or boiling point. So in sodium chloride, you would say that it forms a giant ionic lattice of alternating sodium one plus ions and chloride one minus ions. These have strong electrostatic attractions between them, which require a lot of energy to overcome, and therefore it has a high melting and boiling point. Or you might be asked to describe the bonding in sodium chloride like I just have, but therefore go on to explain why it conducts electricity only when molten and in solution. In which case you would say that in a solid state, the ions are fixed in place and not free to move. However, when it is molten or in solution, the ions are free to move and therefore can carry charge. Once again, thank you for watching. This has been Cardinal Science. If you found the video useful or enjoyable, please leave a like and subscribe or a comment below if you have any questions or requests for future videos. Thank you for watching. Take care.